Welcome back to the channel, everybody. Well, have you guys ever rescued a typewriter? That's kind of what I'm doing here. This is a Voss Model 50. It's actually pronounced more like Voss, except I don't have a good German accent. I'll just use the Americanization and call it a Voss. So this was a intended to be a parts machine at John Lewis's typewriter repair shop here in Albuquerque. And my friend Kevin managed to acquire it from John before any parts were stolen off of it. And so here it is, a Voss Model 50. This dates from about 1952. This is my first Voss typewriter. And uh, let's talk about it, shall we? Stay tuned. Well, these aren't all that common in the United States, especially these older models. And so you might ask yourself, why was this machine slated to be a parts machine? Well, the fact is, it's missing the ribbon cover. And the ribbon cover on this model was kind of a triple layer, swoopy, curvy, kind of molded thing. The body panels are made out of a Bakelite-like material. That is probably one of the first things that gets broken. And I'm sure John Lewis was thinking, it may have good mechanics, but I can't sell it as a reconditioned typewriter missing the cover and also there's a few cracked body panels on the back side because of the brittleness of the bake light so I could kind of see his point from the perspective of being a shop that repairs typewriters and wants to resell them to people to the public but for my purposes as a hobbyist mechanically of course it was very dirty and still needs some cleaning probably because I don't have a solvent tank and I'm not taking apart the entire chassis. Um, so I, I, I tend to do like spot cleaning when I fix a lot of these kind of typewriters. I address key critical linkages, movements, pivot points, things that slide, and then superficial surfaces inside there may still have some oil or grease or whatever or dirt on it, but if they don't involve the mechanics of the machine, if it, I may not address it immediately. Anyway, so I got this machine and it was in need of some work, although I could tell it worked mechanically, basically. The tight bars moved, the ribbon vibrator went up and down, the ribbon spools drove, the platen essentially worked, all the controls on the platen and everything, except the uh, paper bale didn't have any spring pressure on it. And uh, so, it, but it needed a lot of cleaning and everything. So. Uh, let's go through the features of the machine and then we'll talk a little bit about what I've done to it so far. Well, this machine has a full German keyboard and it's what you might call a more modern German keyboard in the sense of it has the digits one through nine. Your number zero is really going to be a shifted O over here and it has the typical German punctuation marks and it also has the uh, accent mark up here. Uh, so then your margin release button is right here on the left side right above the shift lock your uh, bichrome setting is right here on the left side and the backspace key is right here and of course it's an arrow like a lot of these are it has no currency symbols so there's no dollar sign or pound symbol or whatever it has the section symbol a shifted nine is a section symbol the uh, dash on the lower right and the shifted dash is the apostrophe so it does have this accent mark that's a dead key up here which might look like an apostrophe but it's it actually has a separate apostrophe has a period exclamation mark comma question mark no semicolon so a semicolon you would have to do the uh, colon up here and then backspace and do a comma it's a quartz keyboard of course i seem to be able to do quite well typing on a quartz keyboard because of course all you know in comparison to the American style keyboards, it is just really the Y and the Z that's that's different. And I find myself being able to adapt quite easily to the quartz. I don't really type a Z all that often. I do type Ys obviously more than Zs in English. And so I just remember, oh, when I get to a Y, think about it first before you hit it, right? So it seems to work for me. On the left side of the carriage, you have your platen knob and it doesn't pull in or out. Um, it has, of course, a nice long carriage return lever. The line spacing selector is labeled one and then a, a slash for like one and a half and two. But if you actually try it out at the one setting, the platen only 
advances one click, which is actually a half a space. And then the middle setting is two clicks, which is one full space. And then the two setting is really one and a half or three half spaces. I haven't really seen a typewriter before with a half space in place of the one. And I was suspecting that there was something mechanically wrong in the ratcheting system, but I haven't been able to find anything wrong. And I really suspect it's actually a half, one, and one and a half, even though it says one, one and a half and two. And this is not unprecedented because I remember of the three Olivetti letter of 22s that I've owned that all said one, two, and three, they were all one, one and a half, and two. So your um, line spacing uh, indicator may not necessarily be accurate on your machine. It depends. Anyway, so you have the ratcheting here for the line spacing operated by the uh, carriage return line advance lever. There is, of course, a uh, carriage release lever on both left and right sides. Underneath the platen knob is this uh, lever. And in the down position, it gives you standard spacing. If you flip it toward you, you have the, inf the variable spacing. Either way, if you flip it away from the vertical position to the horizontal, that's the variable the line spacing. On the left side of the paper table you have your paper guide which you can use to set the, the left edge of the paper. There is a paper bale that has a nice little finger on it right here for flipping up like that. The paper bale rollers, the rubber rollers, are kind of badly worn and they do need to be replaced. They're cracked and hardened. One of the things I wanted to point out to you before we get any further into this, there is a dealer sticker, a dealer label. Schulteis and Lenzen Bureau Machinen in Köln, Ekener, Strasse 1517, and there's a telephone number. So this was probably the dealer of this typewriter in Germany. And this is, of course, Voss from uh, Wuppertal, right? And here is one of the broken panel corners of this back panel. And then this corner also right here on this bottom panel, there's a crack in it as well. So it looked like the right rear side of the machine suffered some kind of damage in the past. So the left hand margin setting, press and slide. And these margin settings are nicely shaped, kind of oval, dished in with some nice grooves, fine grooves. And then of course the other one over here for the right side. There is a uh, paper support that will flip down onto either side and it does telescope up. There is the right carriage release lever. There is a carriage lock lever, which is right down here, and, and that currently is in the lock position, so I just want to push it back and then that enables the whole carriage to move. It has a nicely sounding bell, a right platen knob, and here's the release lever for the paper bale. And now you might take notice that I have a rubber band wrapped around from the uh, paper release lever around the platen to the front finger of the paper bale roller. And that's because the paper bale does not have any spring tension. And the reason why is because there are some broken metallic leaf springs that actually go right in here. You can see maybe that little screw head. It's a flat, curved, shaped leaf spring of spring steel. There's one on either side, and that's what was intended to give the uh, paper bale the tension it needed. So what I've done in place of trying to find replacement springs, which are almost impossible because they're not coil springs. They're a specially shaped leaf spring. Anyway, I hook a, a rubber band around the backside of the paper release lever underneath here, and the secret to this little thing is you don't want to get it all the way down into the track where the um, carriage runs, but just around the frame, under the frame on the right side, and then hook it around that finger, the right hand finger, and it gives nice tension. And so it's, yeah, it's, a, it's an ad hoc kludge kind of a fix, but that's kind of the way I like it. I, you know, it's functional, and that's, that, that's all that matters to me. Um, so yeah, it's a nice sounding bell. The uh, carriage works well mechanically. The platen roller is very hard. And of course, I mentioned earlier, the paper bill rollers do need some work as well, need replacing. Interestingly enough though, the uh, feed rollers underneath the machine feel quite softer and better shape than 
the platen and it p feeds the paper quite nice. Uh, if I do decide to get the platen resurfaced, probably by JJ Short, I will probably send in all the rollers uh, just to have them do it. Uh, haven't decided on it yet, but most likely. The ribbon system. So this machine uses the uh, similar kind of ribbon reversing system that are used in the Olympia machine. So it's basically a back tension system. It does not require eyelets. Uh, in fact, eyelets will probably jam up through into the ribbon vibrator. So it basically, when the uh, ribbon gets tight, it flips the other side and that's how it reverses. There's a, a little spring-loaded arm here that provides a back tension on the supply reel. And interestingly enough, it's curved the opposite direction from a lot of these that I've seen on other machines. Typically on other machines, it curves in the direction of the, of the pack. But this one is using just the, the front end of the curve there, spring-loaded here. It's the same way on the other side. So it has the fork guide, of course, the ribbon goes through, and the ribbon vibrator. And it's a pretty standard style ribbon vibrator. It looks like a lot of them. The card guide is spring-loaded and it enables you to bend it forward slightly and stick a card uh, behind it uh, for typing on cards and whatnot. Now, there is no touch adjustment on this machine. It's a fixed touch machine. There is no manual ribbon reversing. So to reverse the ribbon, you're really just gonna wanna reach over onto one of these guides and flip it the other way if it, if it hasn't reversed automatically. On the paper scale back here, there is a little scale inset in this window for the paper guide. It helps you to set the paper there. And then the paper bale itself has marks for the paper position and all that. So in terms of line spacing, I expected it to be a European spacing like four characters per centimeter or roughly 11 characters per inch, but it's actually, as I measure it, it's 10 characters per inch, so it's a pica, even though it's a full German keyboard and doesn't really have any, any indication that it was designed for the Western or US market. So underneath the machine here, the escapement is pretty darn easy to get to, and one of the things I really liked about the escapement on this machine is the fact that there's a lot of adjustments. Uh, in, like, for instance, this little nut and screw is the timing for the space bar operation and these two uh, screws are the timing when the character actuation trips the escapement. Of course all your uh, tension springs and levers and whatnot. I like the rectangular feet that are on the machine and they do fit nicely into the bottom case uh, bottom of the case. Uh, they're molded to shape that and actually the rubber on these feet is still Fairly resilient, which is surprising to me, but it is. Okay, let's talk about some of the things I've had to do to this machine. Well, we'll start with the uh, right-hand margin stop. So it should stop typing there, and it should also prevent you from uh, typing a letter. And it wasn't doing that. It would actually allow you to keep typing letters and go beyond the stop. And there was a, an adjustment back in here behind this panel that is a little set screw that needs to hit the, the head of a screw to stop the typing. The space bar needed to be pressed down quite a bit more before it would actually space. In fact, you were getting into the felt padding before it would, it would actuate. So I did adjust that little set screw on the escapement to get a little bit more sensitivity on the space bar. The the whole segment area was all gummed up. A lot of degreasing needed to happen, and it wasn't just the slots of the segment, but it was actually the linkages, the slots and all the linkages, like the combs, and there's several other sets of slots back here that the linkage system goes through, and all those needed to be thoroughly degreased. So then we had some issues also with the ribbon reversing, ribbon advancing, especially on the right side, and it really involves degreasing these linkages thoroughly that involve the, uh, the ribbon um, drive and the ribbon reverse. There's also a cross linkage that runs underneath the vibrator from, the, from one ribbon system to the other, and that was dragging on the frame of the machine and kind of slowing down the ribbon reversing. So that's working a lot more reliably now. Now one of the main problems it had is it was smearing the imprint, and that turned out to be that the escapement wasn't tripping until the 
type slug was basically contacting the ribbon. So the, basically the, the paper was moving as the imprint was being made and so I had to adjust uh, the, uh, the timing on that escapement so that now it, it moves the carriage just before it prints which is about normal now and it, it has cleaned up the imprint quite a bit. Aesthetically, I really love the design of this carriage return lever. It has this beautiful little vertical handle on it that's curved on this side and kind of flat on this side where your fingers touch it. It's just a beautiful little detail. It's not too outgoing and fancy. It's sort of an Art Deco little styling, I would say. It's just a nice looking carriage return lever. And speaking of looks, one of the major attractions to this typewriter was the ribbon cover that's missing on this machine. And so I am going to have to come up with a replacement ribbon cover just for practical purposes. I don't really have any information on the exact design, like size, shape, and all that of the original cover. I've seen photographs on online, but they're not really detailed enough to allow me to, to make one that would reproduce the original. So I'm not going to try to reproduce an original ribbon cover. I'm just going to build a more squarish looking with maybe rounded corners ribbon cover. It comes up above the spools and it'll have a little curved opening right like that. And that's my intention. It's just strictly for practicality. But it does have these locating pins here, here, and two on the other side that helps the ribbon cover fit on there and stay in place. So that's good. Those are locating pins that's real important. Um, I do like the swoopy style uh, I kind of call it a Darth Vader <laughs> space bar I don't know if that's the appropriate term but it, it has this big space bar that wraps all the way down to the front of the machine and, and these two corners here it's just a really interesting styling on this machine and uh, yeah it's quite attractive. The Bakelite uh, panels are textured on the side as you might be able to tell here so they're not smooth, but the trim parts are. And of course, Bakelite is never going to give you a mirror finish. It's more of a kind of a dull shine. Uh, and it is a brittle plastic, so you have to be careful with that. But uh, overall, a real pretty machine. And of course, the gold embossed logo on the back of the paper table Foss, and it's in pretty good shape. Uh, yeah, that's a beautiful logo. That's one of the things about this machine that I do appreciate not being worn too badly. And of course, there's a smaller Voss uh, label on the back of the machine just below the dealer sticker. I think it's worth showing you the uh, base of the case. It has a really nice spring-loaded linkage that locks the typewriter in. There's this lever you flip and these two arms stick out and grab the uh, typewriter frame from underneath, spring-loaded, and then there's these little metal cups that the feet fit into. So it's easy, extremely easy, to put the typewriter in and out of the case. Just set those feet into those little cups and flip those levers like that, and it's nice and secure. And the base also has its own feet right there. So uh, it will not scratch up your tabletop. So on the lid itself, in the back rear, there is a little flange or lip that the base has to fit into, something like that. And then the front, you have to push this little knob to the right to engage that pin, and then there's a locking bail that clips into it to lock it for security. And the handle is actually wood covered in leatherette. And it's actually, the leatherette is peeling off, but the wood handle looks to be in really good shape. The thing that I noticed though when I first saw this typewriter is the width of the case is actually a lot bigger than the size of the typewriter. It looks like a really big typewriter when you look at the case, but not nearly so much when you open it up. Well, let's uh load an old sheet of paper in here, shall we? And it has a very nice typeface. It sort of reminds me of a pre-World War II style typeface in the way some of the letters are formed. Yeah, it's a very pretty little typeface, definitely. 
So one of the things I noticed about this machine is the keyboard feels nice and wide and especially there's good clearance between the A key and the shift lock key. There's almost an entire keys width of difference between them. That makes an entirely different experience from type on a lot of other machines because I have a tendency my left pinky finger has a little crook in it right here and I tend to type instead of straight down it tends to kind of go at an angle and I end up hitting the uh, shift lock a lot of times on a lot of typewriters because of that and uh, so I need a little bit more room in there and this keyboard really feels good my friend Kevin has a newer Voss, the late 1950s version, the curvy shape one, and his has the same kind of wide keyboard. Just a lot of room, and I really like that. So we should probably do a quick measurement on the keyboard and see how it compares width-wise to the Royal Quiet Deluxe and Smith Corona Silent Super that we measured the keyboards of last video. So we measured the bottom row, which was 10 keys, the same number of keys on the bottom row. Uh, on those other two typewriters, it was six and three quarters inches, where this is, uh, yeah, it's about six and three quarter also. And then the width of the keys looks to be about the same. Uh, actually, so the C Royal Quiet Deluxe and the Smith Corona Silent Super were 9 sixteenths approximately inches wide where these keys are narrower they are a 30 second greater than half an inch so that's 17 30 seconds so a little bit narrower and for you people that are using uh, the, the metric system they are about eight and a half millimeters wide close to nine millimeters wide each key is so that means there's a little bit more space between each key, less chance to interfere with a neighboring key as you're hitting it. And of course, this distance between the uh, A key and the shift lock is quite a bit bigger. It is almost a full millimeter of space, which is amazing. Well, some final thoughts and reflections on this machine. So this was not a machine that I sought out to find. It was put into my lap. Having said that though, I really am glad I have it. I didn't need another typewriter in my collection and I have now this one plus another one we'll cover in a later date. I love the feel of it. The keyboard has a great uh, width to it, a great spacing. It works well for my hands. The touch is really good. I'm very comfortable with using the German style keyboard. In fact, the test typing I did a while ago was uh, using that and I was able to hit the Y just fine and not get confused. Cosmetically, yeah, there is a few cracked Bakelite panels behind here as we saw earlier. Those are just gonna have to be the way they are. The missing uh, ribbon cover, aesthetically, it really maybe detracts from the look of the machine as a display item, but practically speaking, it really needs a ribbon cover really just to keep dust and debris out of the segment area. And so I'm gonna probably make a makeshift ribbon cover, not intending to copy the design of the original one, but just to make it functional, okay? It serves the purpose in my collection of another high quality European made German medium-sized portable typewriter. In this case, I gotta say, I kind of like this one better than some of my Olympia SM series typewriters. Now, I can't quite go all the way and say I like it better than my wife's SM3, but I used to own an SM9, and I gotta say, I like the touch on this one better, and I like the keyboard. The keyboard on this one is not as cramped as on those other uh, Olympias. Yeah, I really like this machine, and I think it's going to be a permanent um, member of my typewriter collection, my typewriter family. So, very good. Well, if you guys have any insights into the Voss typewriter lineup and the history of them, man, this was made in 1952. So, it's very likely that the people who made this typewriter had survived the war and uh, they were back to their lifestyle of working and uh, making a living for themselves, putting together these typewriters. And I'm pretty well assuming that the tooling they used for these typewriters is probably preserved from the pre-World War II era. And I am pretty impressed with the design and the build quality overall. It's really pretty rugged.
Well, this is Joe, and again, another typewriter video. Yes, what is this episode? I can't even remember the episodes. We're up to 220-something. Anyways, it's been a great ride. I've enjoyed it, and we'll continue doing these. And if you have any questions or concerns, comments, I'd love to have a dialogue with you. Drop some comments down below. And until next time, of course, stay well and stay creative. Have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye.